You know, I've been in this shop now for 60 days, give or take. My life is simply going to work, coming home, going to work again. It seems to be just nothing but gears, synchronizer rings, and bearings. Maybe an occasional gasket set. I don't know. But the interesting thing is, is that my book, Muncie Four Speed Transmissions, is actually sold out for the first time on Amazon because you guys are at home too, I guess, watching car videos and taking in all my content on YouTube and, and reading my books, which is really moving for me and it means a lot. And so I, I was trying to give it some thought of what I'm gonna do here. And I decided that I would do a full rebuild of a Muncie four speed, not taking it apart, but just how I go step to step, putting it together, all the details. And it's gonna take some time to do this in between actually regular jobs that I have to do, but I, I, I know I'm gonna do it and I really wanna do it for you guys. So all I'm asking you is if you can please subscribe to my YouTube channel, hit the notification links, uh, share an occasional video, that would mean a lot. Tell your friends about it and so forth. So again, I really wanna do this. I'm gonna call it the Muncie Tapes. All right, so when I first do a job, I'll add all the basic parts. I got a gear set here, synchronizer, hubs and sliders, main shaft, main case section, and some odds and ends. I don't have the synchronizer rings here or the bearings or any of the wearable parts because I have to focus on prepping cases and prepping gears first. That's just how I do it. So I'm gonna go run through how I put these transmissions completely together. A lot of people have been waiting for this, so here it goes. So some of my upgrades are the billet aluminum mid plates. One big thing that I like using. I like using the mid plate because I have a hole in it and I have an extended fit counter shaft that has a threaded end on it. This way the shaft will actually bolt to the plate. All right. And that'll allow you not to have the shaft be able to come forward anymore or even rotate once it's torqued down. So what I'll do is this case was gone over, but I might take a file and go over everything like this, make sure all the surfaces are flat. All right, I'm gonna just go over everything. All I'm doing is just simply making sure everything is nice and flat. Taking away all the high spots and visually checking for dings or dents or anything like that because most of these cases are pretty beat up. And you can see, you know, they've been rolled around, they've been bounced around, who knows where they come from. And it feels like it's a little bit high over here, and you can see some dings over here on the case, all the way around, and the edges are raised. The reason why I like doing this is because if I can start off with really flat surfaces, everything's gonna align really well. And that's really important. My mid plates are super accurate. The thing about my mid plates is they use a standard 5 16 dowel. The factory dowel is 309 thousandths, it's a little bit less. <clears throat> so I happen to have a reamer on a drill, very simple reamer on a drill for the 5 16 size. And I'll put this in here and just slowly let it go through, just like that. It's very little material you have to take out. And I'll do the same thing on the extension housing. Extension housing, gonna clean it up. This is a 6465 extension with a driver's side speedo, okay? We're gonna put new bushings on it. You could see they did a good job of cleaning everything, chasing the threads. Looks nice. You could see it's been old. You could see the corrosion that was on it before it was blasted. But this is all part of doing a, a complete you know, build. If you want to use your original parts, you really have to go through everything. So same thing, I could look at this and I could see, make sure that my surfaces are nice and clean and flat. Even the seal surface. Is good even through the mouth pad. Okay, make sure so all your surfaces are nice and square. I'm 
I'm going to do also is ream this hole out. Doesn't take much again. Beautiful. So what I'm gonna do now is these billet mid plates fit a little bit tighter into the cases. They're not going to come in really sloppy. And the idea of the billet mid plate is to do two things, is to add some extra material in the front of the snapper and groove, make it a little bit stronger. Obviously, all these voids have been filled. You just get a nice solid piece. Also, it's a tighter fit and it's got a bigger area over here if they're located in the case. A lot of these aftermarket plates are very thin here. This has got a, more of a load-bearing surface on it as well. So I'll take a rubber mallet. And I'm going to just tap this down into place. And then I could visually look around and see if there's any gaps, if there's anything kind of hanging it up, and go all the way around visually and take a look. And this looks really good. So a lot of these cases, by the way, and mid plates are not necessarily flat. So it's not really advisable to use these mid plates that don't use gaskets or never use just RTV because sometimes you could have some decent voids in the case. But this fits good. I'm going to do the same thing with the extension housing. Put that on as well. So the idea here is that there are locating bosses on the mid plate that located and center it in the case and center it in the tail housing. Some of these aftermarket mid plates are very sloppy and I've done this before in some of my videos to show you the, how sloppy they are. But if you keep everything registered properly because the mid plate is the key in keeping everything aligned because the mid plate is going to locate the extension housing on center and it's going to locate the whole gear train on center relative to the case. So it's important that your fits are tight and not sloppy. So I, I prefer having a little bit of a tighter fit. So uh, same thing I'll look around here. Everything looks nice. It's, it's going to look pretty, isn't it? It's going to look really good when it's all together. So same thing with the side cover surface. Just make sure there's no high spots again. You can square up all your surfaces. You can see over here, this looks like it took a shot and raised the metal a little bit. You can see some of it coming off. You can see that over there, you can see the way it's shiny because it looks like it took a, a hit over here and raised the metal there. All this prep work I do on every gearbox, it's very important. Cover looks pretty clean, but you just want to do a pass. Let's go take a look at this cover for a second here. So this cover looks like the pin hole has been messed up on it. You see what they did here is they welded a little bit of a washer on the end of the pin because the old covers had a pin that could fall through. So let's go punch this out right now and see what we've got here. Because this is all part of prepping the whole case. Let's see if they messed this cover up. Yeah, look at that. So this thing kind of fits a little, not too bad. Let's go put a new pin in this. All right, so I make these new pins for the covers with a little hat on them. They're not available anymore, so I made a bunch of them, so I have them in stock. And what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna just put some 
anaerobic like thread locker. It's a basically replaces press fits. I'm gonna put it all over this pin like this, put it on there, and get it in this bore. So this is called sleeve locker that I use. We sell it, uh, you can get it anywhere if you have kind of semi-loose press fits. And what it does is it'll actually lock this thing up pretty good and also prevent oil from leaking out because it'll act as a sealant. This gets tossed. And so now that's all in good shape, all right? That's all ready to go. This cover is also going to have the bores reamed for billet shifter shafts, so we'll get to that. And so is the extension housing. We're going to basically put new uh, solid steel billet shifter shafts in here because most of these bores are worn or egg shaped by this time. As the, as the covers get old, the bores wear, it's old steel on aluminum. And then what will happen is the oil seals won't be able to really seal it. It'll wobble around and, and leak. And that's why you always have a lot of leaking side seals and Muncie's. It's because the bores themselves are worn. So I want to talk about the shifter shafts. This is a good example of a, a shifter shaft that's worn. The rectangular portion that keys into the linkage arm is pretty well rounded on the corners. And if you have shafts like this, they're going to simply cause the linkage arms to always loosen up and your linkage is going to go out of adjustment. It's not a good idea to keep these. The other thing is, is that GM for some reason made these undersized. They're typically around 746 thousandths but yet the seals they use are designed for a 750,000 shaft. So when the seals go on here, they're actually designed to be on a bigger shaft. So the other thing is, is that these shafts are simply just keyed in the back. I've seen these crack and break over here and come apart and loosen up. And then this part gets loosened and you get some end play within the shifter shaft itself because it's basically two components that can wear and eventually they get sloppy this way. So usually when I do my builds, unless the person requires the original pieces, I will put in these steel billet shifter shafts. They're heat treated and TIG welded together, so they're not gonna move, and they're ready to go. It's keyed the same way as the stud type shifter shaft. In other words, the, the keyed portion here is the same, except it takes a grade eight 5 16 fine threaded bolt that goes in there. It's much better design than using studs. So. Being that these are 750 thousandths and are slightly oversized, I'm going to have to need a reamer here to simply open up the bore of the side cover and extension housing. I'll just do one for you. It'll fit in there. It'll start on the bore usually like this. You could do it with a, a socket at the end of your reamer. This is what I do. And you just kind of go in there and just open it up. All right. That's what I'm going to do. Just go in like this fashion and go through it and keep on doing it until it comes through the other side. And when you get it to where it feels nice and easy, just pull it out. And you'll see that these will fit in nice now. See? No movement. It's perfect. I do that for the cover and for the extension housing. Same thing. Now once these are done, so what I want to do is put the seals in first into the cover and the seal in as well in the extension housing. So what I do is when I use the seals, there are rubber clad seals which tend to be on the loose side. In other words, they look like uh, this. These are the rubber clad seals. The thing is they, they really can, you can almost just press these in, all right? I don't like them because I think they get loose, but some people sell these in kits, but I don't use them. I just wanted to show you what they look like. I like to use these seals that I carry because they seem to be a little bit tighter, but you should put some sealant on the outside of the seal, okay? Just like this and put it in there. And I use just simply a, a socket that fits it perfectly. You just kind of go in there, just tap it in.
I checked that to see that the seal is even all the way around, that it's not at an angle. And that's it. Looks nice. Do the same thing with all the other seals in the extension housing, okay, and in the cover. So part of the assembly of the side cover, I like to just get this out of the way as far as the scissors fit in there correctly and the so I'm not dealing with it later on, all right? So it's just something I like doing. You don't have to do anything in, in this order. This is how I, I do them. So I figured I'd just show you. Then you could do is you could actually put them in to see how they feel on the seal, okay? Fits good. Nice. So let me talk about assembling the cam mechanism in the side cover. What I do is I will deburr the cams, make sure there's no high spots on them. When they're together, I want to make sure that they're nice and flat against one another, that they, they slide nicely, they don't hang up or anything like that. The other thing is I'll just simply drop them in. And if you drop them in, you could see a lot of times there's a big gap. See that gap? And that means that these are going to move a lot. So what I'll do is, I've, I have these 30,000 stick washers. I'll put this one in, put that one in, put that one in, put another one in, and if I can fit the D-clip in, which I can, like that, I have minimal rocking motion of the cams. So they're in there good, they look good, and I'll put the spring in. So these, uh, Early cams have a little bit more bite than the later cams into the shift fork. So I'm using a 16-pound spring instead of a 20-pound spring. So what I'll do is I'll catch it in this uh, one cam. And with the pliers, hold it. I'm just trying to get a good grip on it. Bring it in like that. That's ready to go. Take the extension housing. By the way, I'm using this Dynatex, one of my favorite sealants. It's on my website, 494.77. It's a good anaerobic gel. Good to put it around the outside of any seal. It really makes a nice seal and takes up any imperfections that you might have in your housing. It prevents oil from leaking around the seal. So same thing. So I use that socket I had. So I reposition the camera so we can get in there and take a look at the bushing bore. We want to make sure that when you're putting bushings in the bore that it's nice and smooth, that there's no high spots that can cause the bushing to actually get peened up. So I'll look here and it looks to me like I might see something that looks like a little bit of a raised edge. And I'll come in there with a file and clean it up a little bit. Just double check my edges, make sure they're chamfered better so that the bushing, when it goes in, doesn't again get peened upward and then prevent the yoke from going in. Any transmission, you want to make sure the yoke fits in the tail housing first and then you want to make sure, of course, that the yoke fits on the main shaft before you put both components together. So that's all I do. So I like using these bronze dimpled bushings in my extension housings, but in any bushing, you, they kind of go together with like a little bit of a puzzle lock, I call it. And if you run your fingers over those, they're very rough. And again, if they're not smooth, they're gonna balloon the bushing inward and prevent your yoke from going in properly. So what I simply do, and you could do this with file or anything, is I'll take my rotary wheel, wheel here, and I'll just smooth all this stuff down. It doesn't have to be accurate, you just want to break these high spots. Then what you want to do is never put the puzzle lock here, going through the oil return. You always want to put it 180 degrees above it, like this. So, 
What I also do is I'll take some of that anaerobic gel because this helps lock the bushing in. It'll, with this stuff, you'll never actually have a bushing ever spin in extension housing. So I'll put that in. Now, if you have a press, you could do it on a press, which is what I would normally do. But I'm assuming that you might not have a press to do this. So you might have to use, let's say, a, a driving tool of some sort. And if you're going to do that, what you want to do is not really ever hit directly on the bushing, but use one of these tools and just start the bushing down. And, and keep a downward pressure on the bushing so you're not peening the bushing over. Once you have it started like this, the reason why this, this, this is great is because by having it actually hit the outside and the bushing, it kind of makes sure that the bushings align somewhat. And once you do that, you could use something like this. This is a setup. You can get these kind of bearing driver, these race driver sets from uh, Harbor Freight. And then you can just dr drive it down. So starting the bushing is a process because if you start it at an angle, you'll, you'll, you'll bend the bushing. What you want to do also is once you do that, is just go in there and just dress the area up on the outer edge just so it's not peened at all. Even though this looks pretty good, I just don't want any problems. Then what I'll do is I'll take a yoke now, a drive shaft yoke, and fit it in here. See if it's okay. Hopefully it is. That fits nice. Now what you could also do is I have call it if you have a sacrificial yoke. Because if you have a high spot, sometimes you can take the, the, the a hammer and actually hit the yoke like this and and flatten those high spots out. Use the yoke as kind of an inside peening you know hammer. But this fits really good right off the bat there. Okay, it's no problem. So let's talk about rear seals real quickly here. This is a typical SKF single lip design seal. You, you find these in a lot of the new extension housing kits that are available on the market. I never use these seals, even though it looks like a great seal. I prefer to use a triple lip seal. It's non-flange, but it has three distinct lips inside here. And so you basically got a dust shield and two other lips. And I've been using these seals for years. They don't leak. Now what I do with the seals is I'm going to take some grease. I'll grease the inside of the seal. So on initial fire up, it's not going to get damaged. And I'll also pack some grease in the inside of it like this. And what that does is that'll prevent the spring from possibly popping out. Now, same thing, I'll take anaerobic gel and put it on the outside of the seal, just a skin coat. Most of it will get pushed right out again, just to keep some imperfections from causing any oil leaks around the seal. And then just start with the driver and gradually work around. You have to have a feel for making sure that the seal isn't kind of going at an angle. And if it does, hit the opposite side, and then eventually just drive right down the middle. I kind of do it like this, so that I can see that the seal is all flat. Wipe off the excess sealant. So a lot of times I've, I, I've removed this pad so that the extension housing doesn't slip around, but a lot of people ask me how I, I put in these detents. And what I'll do is I'll grease the spring, Grease this whole area up. I'll take some grease and put it on the ball to hold the ball in place on top of the spring. Now, what I use is I take one of these pry bars and I have ground the end of the pry bar to a more of a sharper point and with a little bit of a lead in to help get this thing in there underneath the, the shifter shaft. And what you can do is you can Put it in there, 
like this. It'll go in, and then what you're going to want to do is get this piece underneath there. And it's almost like you got to do it by feel, but you want to have the, the detent opening lined up with the ball so it'll slide in with just slight pressure of the ball down. So I can feel it goes down there, like right now, just like that, and then slide it through. See? Use these late shifter shafts. You don't have to worry too much about them getting pushed in too far and the ball sneaking out. But on some T10 transmissions and early shifter shafts, this is a little bit thinner on the backside. So you could push it in too far and then the ball will pop out again on you. So what you want to do is just leave it so that it's, it's over the ball like that. So it's not allowing the ball to kind of sneak out. So the last part of the tail housing is, uh, assembly is simply putting in the reverse fork. It's no big deal. It just goes in like this. But a couple of pointers about reverse forks. They do wear. Oftentimes I find them they're pretty sloppy this way, up and down, side to side. And even some of the new replacement forks that companies are offering, a lot of the aftermarket ones probably made offshore, are fairly sloppy. And that could lead to some undesirable problems later on down the line with the reverse gear bouncing around things. What I did is make my own forks. They're USA made. They fit in tighter. They fit in just slightly tighter so there's no movement. I'm, you could see I'm trying to move it. I can't. So I like to assemble my units with my own forks because they're tighter. I make them out of 8620, heat treated, all that good stuff. But there you go. So the extension housing is now complete. All right, there you go. Seal, bushing, seal here, all that stuff. I just got to clean it up and made it a little messy here. All right, so that's ready to go back together. All right, as far as the case goes, it's a 385-1325 case, which was primarily used in GM vehicles in 64 to 1965 model years. It's a replacement case. It's not an original case because it has a CC9 number on it, which means counter case nine, which means that it was a replacement case probably issued in the year of 1969. These cases uh, come from the factory brand new, but with a wider pad on them. Now, the case was bored out to fit the later one inch counter shaft, and we're going to be using again that extended fit counter shaft with the threaded section for the billet mid plate. It also had the lower boss actually drilled and tapped for a drain plug, which is very important. So, got some new plugs on it for fill and drain, and also the ears of the case have been spot faced and cleaned up so we get a nice clamping surface. So, it's very good. All the threads have been chased, a few helicoils put in it. Overall, it looks really good. All right, so I'm really happy with the way the case preparation turned out. I want to give a special shout out to Dave R. from Virginia for allowing me to have this transmission in my shop for a very long time and having the patience because a lot of work has been backlogged with this COVID thing and just a lot of nonsense going on. So again, we got the ball rolling. Next video, I don't know, maybe come out in about another week or so, but it's been really great. And again, thank you for watching my videos. If you've learned something, guys, if you really appreciate what I'm doing, please take the time to subscribe to my channel and share my videos and hit the notification links and drop me some comments. All the information about how to contact me is in the video's description. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it.